Hello, everybody. I am here to help you to pass the EOC this December. I don't know the exact date, but it's in early December. And so what I did is I went back to my PowerPoints, which I think are really good, and I hope you enjoy them with lots of pictures. And I'm going to teach you pretty much just what you need to know for the EOC. Okay. And if um, now remember, I'm going to talk at a pace that might be a little bit slow, but I think that's important because nobody wants a teacher that talks too fast. But look, so I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna try to make myself slow down. I am aware that you know some of this stuff. I hope you do, okay? Um, well, you guys are, anyway, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, by the way, so, all right, let's just get started here. So we're gonna start at the beginning. First of all, I want you to know that you need to be able to describe different eras of U.S. history, okay? So you've got, sorry, my video is in the way there. Okay, so you have different eras of U.S. history, and you need to be able to identify them if given a brief description. And I will show you different multiple choice questions. You will see about two of these on every single EOC. So you need to know the, what it means by westward expansion or the Gilded Age or the Progressive Era. And U.S. expansionism, for some reason, they started calling that rise of a world power, okay? World War I, the Roaring Twenties, or also called the Jazz Age, the Jazz Age, the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War, the 60s. And then we jump forward to the war on terror, you know, the war on Afghanistan, and in to some extent the war in Iraq, and then the, but anyway, in that time period. Okay. All right, so let's get started on westward expansion. Okay. So we're talking about late 1800s here, how we treated the Native Americans. Um, be familiar with the Dawes Act. Now, the Dawes Act was. It meant well, some guy named Dawes, he wanted to stop locking Indians up in reservations. So what he said was, hey, let's turn them into farmers and let them farm the land, and then we don't have to put them up in reservations and stuff. I mean, the guy Dawes meant well, but what ended up happening is, is that um, it was an attempt to assimilate Native Americans into white culture. You can't just take buffalo hunters and nomads who live in teepees and teach them how to farm. Now, I'm not saying that they that can't be done, but that was their culture. Not all Native Americans were buffalo hunters, but the ones in this general area of the country were. And you can't just give them crappy land and teach them to farm. That's not always going to work. So what ended up happening is that these lands that the natives weren't able to farm on were sold to white people at auction. This is a very sanitized, childish version of the Dawes Act, but check it out. Okay. Remember, if you ever want to look at something, you need to hit pause. Sometimes I want to just keep going, because, um, just in case. But if you want to hit pause, the space bar usually works, or just hit pause with your mouse, but you need to be able to hit pause, especially when we talk, do multiple choice questions. So eventually the lands, if the natives weren't able to farm on it, were sold at auction basically to white people. And this is sad, it's a sad chapter, but you know, it basically the history of Native Americans is never a happy one in this country, okay? And also you need to know the word assimilation. Assimilation is conformity into American culture. So look at this picture right here. This is the same guy. It's the same guy. So this is the before. And look at him with his beautiful long hair and his beautiful jewelry and his Native American clothes. And what they did was they gave him a haircut, gave him jewelry. I mean, took away his jewelry, gave him a suit, turned him into a white guy, basically. Okay? Okay. Now, I'm not saying that assimilation is all bad. I'm, assimilation can be a good thing. Teaching, teaching kids to speak English if they're immigrants, that's fine. Okay, giving kids a basic education, that's fine. 
And if I were to move to China, I would need to assimilate into their culture. Okay, I would need to learn to speak Mandarin or learn to use chopsticks. Okay. Um, Native Americans attending school. This is assimilation. I'm not saying that this is bad. I'm saying that when you tell people that their culture sucks, that's bad. Okay, and the Dawes Act was an attempt to do that. Okay, so when we look at multiple choice questions, you know, you may really, you, this is where it's easy to get lazy. You need to hit pause and you need to really think about it, okay? Because that way you don't have to do it twice, okay? So look at this question. What was the purpose of the Dawes Act? Okay, hit pause on your computer and then I'm going to give you the answer right now. The answer is... All right, so this is a tough, so what they did was they took land, like massive, many acres of land, and they divided it up among families. I didn't teach that here, I normally do. And so remember the natives didn't believe in private property, so this was new for them. But imagine like where you believe that all the land owns is belongs to everybody, and now you're told that the land belongs to you, just you and your family. It's a different culture. It's a different mindset. It is not C. It was not about moving um, Native Americans to reservations. It was actually an attempt to keep them off of reservations. All right, not an easy question. This advertisement refers to what legislation and what effect did this have? Okay, hit pause, answer it. The answer is the Dawes Act. Okay, moving right along. Okay, moving on to the Homestead Act. So in when you look at the Great Plains, that's all land, including Texas, but north of Texas, where you got a lot of flat land without a lot of hills, without a lot of trees. And, and now that the Native Americans sadly were gone, now it's like the United States wanted basically white people to move out there and take over. And so the United States government said this, if you move out to Iowa or Nebraska or out there in this area and you build a permanent settlement, a shelter on it, like a wooden house or a, or a mud house, and you do something with it for five years, you know, farm it, then you pay a small tax and, and then the land is yours. It's free. It's a land grant. That is the Homestead Act, okay? Know the Great Plains. The Great Plains is here. Here's the Great Plains, everywhere north of Texas. And this is basically what it looks like. Not a lot of trees, not a lot of water, a lot of grass. It's good for farming grasses like wheat and corn, but there aren't a lot of trees, so it's going to be tough to live there for a while. Settlers built their houses out of sod, and mud, what they would do is they would take their wagons and make windows and doors out of their extra wagon and then make the rest of their house out of sod. It's not the worst way they'll live considering how dirty the cities were at the time, but that's the Dawes, that's the Homestead Act to give away land. Soon the railroads will come and it will, listen to me, raise the standard of living raise the standard of living. It's gonna make life better for them. Look at these two houses. The one on the left was before the railroad. The one on the right is after the railroad. The railroad can bring lumber or timber to these people. You see any trees in this picture? No. So you had to bring in the, the lumber by railroad, okay? And eventually glass and screen doors and stuff like that. Uh, Sears eventually was selling things through the railroads. You know, you could have something shipped to you. Think of Sears as like Amazon back in the late 1800s. You could buy a sewing machine or cloth or timber. All right. How did the expansion of railroad transportation most benefit farmers in the United States? Okay, so we're looking for a benefit. So make sure your answer is a benefit. Okay, hit pause if you need to. The answer is C. 
What does that mean? It means if you're in Nebraska, you can put your wheat on a train and sell it in a distant market, like say up in Chicago or something, something far away. That's the benefit of a railroad to a farmer. Okay. How did the Homestead Act contribute to the settlement of the Western lands? Okay, so think about what is the Homestead Act? The answer is, the answer is A, it, it was a land grant, it just gave away land, okay? The purpose of the Homestead Act of 1862, which provided free federal land, was to what? The answer is A. Back then, the West, when you capitalize the West, was basically anything west of the Mississippi River, okay? Some people even think of Texas as the West. That's debatable, but yeah, okay? Homesteaders on the Great Plains found it necessary to build the type of house shown in the photograph because why? Okay, hit pause, but the answer is, let's see, they didn't have a lot of wood. They didn't have a lot of trees, so they had to build it out of mud. Okay. All right, moving on to the Gilded Age, new chapter. Okay, so the Gilded Age was another time period, and it was in the late 1800s. It was a time period of industrialization, urbanization, big business, like Carnegie and Rockefeller, the tr or, you know, Vanderbilt and the trains, J.P. Morgan and the banks. Those are big businesses. Laissez-faire, laissez-faire means hands off. It means the government will leave you alone and let you do whatever you want. So if you're Carnegie and you're polluting the rivers and the air, you know, they don't care. The government doesn't care. The government was laissez-faire. It was hands off. It was in the late 1800s. Okay. So this was a time of excess. Not everyone was rich. What you had was like the top 1% had a lot of money. And then everybody else worked 14 hour days in factories and stuff. Okay, it was gilded. Think of it as like bedazzled. Think of a crazy cell phone cover that's all sparkly, you know, bedazzled and shiny. I like to think of it as a dog turd. It's shiny on the outside. But if you start digging, what do you get? Crap, right? The Gilded Age wasn't all bad, but you had the country was growing rapidly. Urbanization, the cities were growing, lots of immigration, labor was cheap, and the country was growing. Um, now, you could call these guys robber barons. That doesn't sound nice, but these guys used ruthless tactics to destroy their competition and to keep workers' wages low. So these guys were billionaires and they were paying their workers minimum wage. Sounds like Jeff Bezos, right? Rockefeller, Standard Oil, and the most important, Carnegie Steel. I say Carnegie because that's how his name was pronounced, but we like to say Carnegie a lot too. Okay, that's because that Carnegie was how his name was pronounced. Okay, I want to tell you about a trust. This is Rockefeller. And look what he's standing on. Standard oil. But look at his crown. The railroads. A trust is a lot like a monopoly. But what Rockefeller did was he made a relationship with the railroads. He said, hey, railroads, ship only my oil. If you ship any other oil, I'll take my oil somewhere else. It, do not ship any of my competitors' oil, and I will pay you fairly. And so, as a result, Rockefeller became the richest man in the world, and he ran all of the other oil companies out of business. So it's like a it's like a monopoly. Okay, it really is like a monopoly. Here's another cartoon. Notice what it says: Standard Oil. And it's saying that, that Rockefeller has too much power over the government. Okay, here's another one. Rockefeller. And look, what's he got in his hand? 
the White House. And the, and the caption for this is, what a funny little government. Look at all the oil. Okay. Carnegie, steel, Pennsylvania. Okay. Remember the Bessemer process? You pump hot molten hot air through molten steel and you burn off the impurities. That's the Bessemer process. Carnegie did not invent steel, but he mass produced it. He made it cheap and affordable for everybody. Just like Henry Ford and cars. Henry Ford did not invent the car. He made it affordable to the average person. So Carnegie made steel cheap and available, gave lots of jobs to people, donated millions to libraries and trade schools. But he was also, he paid low wages, polluted the air and water, and he fought strikes with violence rather than give raises. So yeah, is he a titan of industry or a robber baron? The answer is yes. Okay. A monopoly is when one company owns the entire industry. Think of it as if you only had one internet service, they're going to treat you like crap because they have no competition. And a trust is basically the same thing. Two major industries working together like railroads and oil to run the competition out of business. So the Gilded Age had lots of big businesses like Standard Oil, Carnegie Steel, and there are pros. The pros is that big businesses can give us lower prices because they're efficient. But cons, the bad stuff, they, they have an unfair competitive advantage. They take advantage of their workers. They pollute. And they have way too much government influence. Think about how Walmart kind of fits all this. Maybe even Amazon. Okay. Laissez-faire, hands-off government, lazy government. So the Gilded Age, the government was hands-off. The government was laissez-faire, lazy-faire. Okay? All right. So look at this question. This is a time period question. Okay? Remember I said you need to be able to identify time periods. This cover from a 19th century periodical, that means magazine, helps illustrate that the United States was beginning to change from, okay, now remember, 19th century, that's the 1800s, okay? All right, the answer is, so the country was urbanizing during this time. Urban means city, rural means country. During the Gilded Age, there was a notable increase in federal support for what? Okay, the answer is A. Remember I said big business. Which term refers to a time which, in which greed and corruption ran rampant while displays of respectability, generosity, and reform provided a distracting overlay or a gilded veneer to that decadence. Okay, a lot of big words there, but we're talking about the Gilded Age. After using the Bessemer process, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, but it's just talking about Carnegie and the Bessemer process. He was an industrialist, okay? All right, working conditions were bad, okay? 14-hour days, dangerous, dirty. They were bad during the Gilded Age. They'll get better in the Progressive Era, but they were bad, okay? Long working conditions. Children were employed. We need to get her out of the factory and into the schools, but that won't happen until the, the Progressive Era in the next time. Child labor. Um, you're not going to school. You might as well do some work, okay? The worst were the coal miner boys. These kids would be dead by the time they were 20 from all the coal dust they breathed in. All right, political machines. I want you to think like this is like the mafia running the government. 
Now, I'm not saying that political machines were all bad, okay? Imagine you just got off the boat from Russia. You have no job, no place to live. And these guys, you need a job, I'll get you a job. You need a place to live, I'll get you a place to live. And you're like, thanks, man. And then when it came down, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to get everyone in this building to vote for the mayor in the next election. Back then, your vote was public record. And so um, if you didn't vote for the right guy, people come after you. Okay? So political machines, What also what they would do is they would reward um, different neighborhoods with bridges and plumbing and paved streets, and then they would punish other neighborhoods who did not vote for the mayor. Like imagine if your building was on fire and the firemen show up and just sit there and cross their arms. And they're like, how come you're not putting this fire out? And like the boss said to not let it burn. I'm going to let it burn. Because if you didn't vote for the mayor, then the mayor would get back at you that way. That's how political machines operated. So they weren't all bad. They did help immigrants get settled, but they were corrupt and they would give their friends jobs instead of qualified people jobs. So what was one reason for the expansion of machine politics in the late 19th century? So when was the 19th century? 1800s. All right. The answer is, hit pause if you need to, but the answer is A. Influx means a whole bunch coming at once, okay? So all these immigrants came and they needed help. The government wasn't doing it, so the political machines did it. So they weren't all bad, but they were bad. During the 19th century, one way political bosses gained voter support was by what? Okay. So what they would do would be like, oh, this neighborhood needs a street. I'm going to give them a street. This neighborhood over here, they need a bridge. Screw them. They're not getting their bridge. They didn't vote for me. The word infrastructure is like bridges and plumbing and, you know, like stuff that you need to build to make your cities run right. Today, we would call internet service infrastructure. Okay. Which of the following best characterizes the Gilded Age? Okay, so here's another time period question. Hit pause. The answer is B. Okay, so that describes the Gilded Age. Okay. All right, immigration. Why do immigrants come to this country? Because usually jobs. Okay, that's a pull factor. Push factor, another good example of a pull factor would be like a gold rush, like the Klondike gold rush, okay? Or free land, like the Homestead Act, that would be a pull factor. Push factors are bad things like war and uh, poverty, famine, you know, diseases that would push people out of where they came from. Okay, free land was a pull factor. Okay, the Klondike Gold Rush was a pull factor. It pulled people up near Alaska. Okay, push factors are bad stuff to push immigrants away, like war or disease. Like in Ireland, they had a potato famine. Okay, all right, I've never seen the word tenement on the test, but you need to know that immigrants lived in overcrowded slums. All right, so typical picture with laundry hanging out, no indoor plumbing sometimes, sometimes no windows. And sometimes they would rent, they would have some men sleep in the daytime, and then another shift they would sleep there at night, you know, for the desperate. Okay. Um, this is kind of a joke, but I wanted you to know the difference between urban and rural. Urban means city. Rural means country. Okay. Immigrants, when they moved here, they tended to move to cities and they tended to live in neighborhoods of people similar to themselves. So in Italians moved to New York, Polish moved to Chicago, you know, Irish moved to Boston. Okay. 
So what were the greatest challenges that immigrants faced during the Industrial Revolution or during the Gilded Age? The answer is A. Okay. All right. A high school teacher wrote these bullet points on the whiteboard. What was the most likely topic of discussion? Okay, hit pause. The answer is C. These are push and pull factors up on the board. All right, nativism. Nativists don't like immigrants, okay? Look at Uncle Sam's face. Look at that look of disgust at this immigrant. And what is this immigrant carrying with him according to this cartoon? Poverty, disease, and some other stuff. Why don't nativists like immigrants? Well, they're a little racist, but a lot of it has to do with jobs, okay? Um, immigrants, uh, nativists, say that we don't want immigrants because they take away our jobs, okay? Now, we all know that that's partially true, and we all know that there is a little bit of racism involved, but that's what your test is going to ask you. It's about competition for jobs, okay? Here's a cartoon. Look at these wealthy guys from the Gilded Age, and they're telling this immigrant to stop. Stop, immigrant. But look, look at these ghosts. They, the nativist, would close to the newcomer, the bridge that carried them and their fathers over. And that's kind of how it is today. You've got um, some people who whose parents were immigrants, but now they are railing against immigration, okay? Because of nativism, especially out in California, you had the Chinese Exclusion Act. And what it did was it stopped, it outlawed immigrants from China for 10 years. Why? Because nativists in California believed that Chinese were taking away people's jobs. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's an example of nativism. Here's a, a cartoon that's talking about immigration restrictions. So let's stop immigration into this country. And that's what America did um, during some times in American history. I think this cartoon is from the 1920s, but yeah, immigration restrictions. Nativists like immigration restrictions. All right, 19th century nativist organizations advocated what? Hit pause. And the answer is, I told you to hit pause. You didn't do it. Now, now the answer is D. Promoting an ethnically, ethnically homogenous, meaning like everybody's white. They want everybody to be the same. Society through restrictions on immigration. Restrictions on immigration. Okay? You need to hit pause because if the answer is D, then you're not really using your brain. And you maybe you're smart and you can handle it, but you need to be careful. Okay, here we go. Which group of people most likely inspired the creation of this 1893 cartoon? The answer is D, nativist. Which situation does the car, this cartoon from an early 1900s pamphlet illustrate? Okay, so read the words and look at these hats. Okay, Uncle Sam, why not give them an equal chance? And what are they saying? Don't let them come in. Okay, so do the question. The answer is, it's about fear jobs. We know it's a little bit about racism too, let's be honest. Okay, all right, that's enough for this lesson. Good luck, I'll see you next time.